There are many harbingers of doom in our industry at the moment, and whilst there is definite cause for concern in certain areas, I'm one of the people who think that we're about to actually enter into a golden era, and as Jack Conte said, even a second renaissance. What does this mean? Well, it's a proliferation of possibility and opportunity for us, particularly when writing music for picture. Amazon, Disney, YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, they're all fighting to the death for content, and we're here to create it for them. But the likelihood is we're gonna have to do it out of sheds, bedrooms, our homes. I, for some years, have, have kind of oscillated between working from home and working from a professional location. And this has proven to be an ideal location. But if I'm gonna to have to do everything myself, including mixing, is this really a suitable environment? Can you ever make a garden shed acoustically sound? Well, that's what we're gonna find out in today's vlog. Okay, so quick disclaimer, working on a couple of massive projects at the moment and the studio, well, it looks more like a workshop than a studio, but come on in and you'll see instantly it's got a kind of slightly more spaceshipy vibe about it. Now, I broke two cardinal sins this year. I didn't only change the operating system on my main computer whilst doing a project, but I changed computer and ripped my entire studio to bits in order to get this acoustic treatment in. One of these projects that I'm working on is a 5.1 project, so basically I want to mix it here, so we're gonna get, a, get it all set up for surround and stuff like that. So in a minute, we're gonna go to Ben from Yellow Technology, who's not only gonna tell us about how he did this room, but give you a few tips on, without any money, on how you can improve your listening environment to get more, I guess, accurate mixes from wherever you're working from. So the immediate thing that you'll notice is that we've got these um, roof panels, which really has reduced um, headroom by about that much, which you really notice as you go in. Fortunately, I'm not a tall man, I'm five foot eight, and, um, and if I was any taller, I would actually have to duck here. But it's, I, I kind of like the vibe because it feels enclosed and focusing in towards my screen. And you'll notice also there's quite a gap between these. Uh, these are kind of, they're dangled. Is that the word, the technical term? They're dangled from the roof. And, um, and there's quite a gap, I'd say, about that much between them, which is interesting. And then we've got these side panels. We've picked a colourway so that the side panels are the same colour as the ceiling and the ceiling panels are the same colour as the wall and I think that, that kind of colour differential works quite nice but there's loads of repair work I've still got to do from all of my old shoddy acoustic treatments. Now something's really interesting that I have noticed and as you can probably guess I know nothing about this stuff. Um, they're not all the same these panels. If you tap this one it feels really hard it feels to me like a metal plate and it sounds like a really shit plate reverb. This one feels like it's like it's like a foam but it's, it, it barely has any give at all. And then if I take you around here, we've got this I suspect is wood and if you see there you can see there's little holes and I think it's that stuff I remember going into studios like in the 1980s and you'd get these panels on the walls which were um, wood with kind of black holes in them and I think that that might be what that is. But let's go to talk to Ben, Yellow Technology, who's gonna tell us about how he designed the acoustic treatment for this room and give you a few tips on how you can improve your listening environment. Hi Ben, how are you doing? Hey Christian, good to see you, how are you doing? Very good, very good indeed. Now, when I last saw you, uh, restrictions were somewhat uh, looser. So we're having to do this remotely, regrettably, now. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hold out till the pub's open again, shall we? I'm just absolutely delighted with how this has worked out. And I just want to kind of understand the process a bit better. And I guess my first question to you is, how would you define a bad acoustic, which you defined in my shed? You, you came in and went, it doesn't sound very, doesn't sound very good in here. Um, how would you define a bad acoustic? It's something that doesn't um, doesn't sound how you want it to, I, I guess. And that's quite a big thing, I think, about working with acoustics is, is that not to treat everyone the same. You're a composer, um, and so your 
very interested in how things are going to end up sounding, but you are probably quite interested in having quite a lot of stuff around you as well. <laughs> There's a compromise to be had. You know, I, I can't put you in a, in a room with, with, you know, one chair, uh, lots of acoustic treatment in the perfect shape and no other things and make you make good work. You know, I can't make you write good music at that point. So immediately you're kind of thinking about the compromise, I guess. So I think a room that represents what's going to arrive at, um, at mastering or at dub is important. I guess the, the first stage of, of rectifying my acoustic was to carry out some measurements. What were those of? Because they were like physical measurements as well as sonic ones, weren't they? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So I, I, I had to listen to the room with playing some music for a start and um, things that I know translate well um, and um, notice some things about how, how that sounded to me. Um, and anyone can do that at any point. And, you know, a mix you know really well, play it everywhere that you get the chance to and you'll notice that it sounds completely different everywhere. And then I took some some measurements with a measurement microphone um, so eff effectively playing uh, sine sweeps out of one of your loudspeakers and then the other one, and then recording that back at the microphone about where your ears are. Unsurprisingly, uh, probably, <laughs> um, the, the, the graph that results isn't, isn't flat. And, and that's effectively, to an extent, that's a representation of uh, what your ears might be experiencing um, at that position. Um, and then I can do, as I start to notice things in the graph, like I might notice a little lump in a certain area, I can then start to move the microphone around to, to narrow down what might be causing that, that issue in the room. Um, lots of uh, the low frequency uh, artifacts of, of a room acoustic are related to dimensional characteristics of the room. So that's why I, I did a lot of tape measure work in that the, very much the dimensions and the shape of your room affect what's loud and what's quiet at different positions in the room, particularly at the low frequency end. So um, it, it's, it's useful to have those dimensions at that point. Is that when certain dimensions of the room match the actual length of the waveform at that frequency? Is that called a mode or something? Yep, that's right, that's right, uh, a mode. So yeah, two parallel surfaces in, in a room, um, a standing wave can be set up between them where we're affected for you've got a sound wave bouncing off one and then going to the other. And, and you, what you end up with is across that plane, you get uh, po points at that frequency which corresponds to that length where, where the sound is very loud or very quiet. Um, and so that, that, that's that phenomena where you go in perhaps, uh, well, any room, but maybe a studio that hasn't uh, been acoustically treated very well. And that thing you see people in front of the monitors where they duck their head down and go up, the sound, the bottom end of the sound changes rapidly as you go up and down. That's the most common phenomena there because that dimension is very small, usually, you know, floor to ceiling, um, your head moving up and down, bending your knees, um, you're, you're moving across quite a large percentage of that dimension. So you're going to experience the loud and the quiet bits quite quickly there. So basically, it's, it's a form of resonance, is that correct? Or is yeah, it... that's right. That's right. So it's boosting at some frequencies and cancelling others, I guess. That's happening um, as well as at the, at the instant that you hear the, the sound from the speakers. It's also happening dynamically, and that slightly changes. In your room, the, the decay remains at certain low frequencies for a long time after the sound has gone. Um, and that, that's quite a big thing uh, and often overlooked. Yeah, the actual, the way a room decays from a, a sound is it changes. So it's always worth looking at that. So if we take a look at the responses for the left and right loudspeaker, uh, the listening position here, you can see that particularly at low frequencies, th there's a fair bit of variation between the two speakers, these big peaks and troughs where the lines don't always align. Uh, and that's being caused by asymmetry in the room. Um, primarily in this case, uh, when we took these measurements, uh, your speakers weren't positioned about the centre of the room. Uh, and thus they, they were responding differently at low frequencies um, before the sound even reaches your ears. There's also quite a lot of asymmetry in other fixtures and fittings in the room, furniture that, that, that isn't symmetrical and stuff that you probably can't always change, but they're causing lots of these smaller inaccuracies in this graph as well. So I think this graph describes the dynamic response of your room fairly well. That is, 
the way the sound in the room decays over time with respect to frequency. So each line on this graph as I move down is 15 milliseconds later. So if I take a look at, say, 1 kilohertz here, 120 milliseconds after the sound first reached your ears, it's decayed by, what's that, way over 20 dB. Um, as with, if we fly down to the bottom here, what, somewhere this is around 57 hertz, 120 milliseconds after the sound first arrived at your ears is only decayed by less than 10 dB. And so that's what I mean about this phenomena of, of resonances at the bottom end ringing on long after the high frequency and mid frequency decay has pretty much disappeared. And the same kind of thing's clear on this waterfall plot, which is, is a little bit more familiar to some, I'm sure. Uh, uh, so up here at one kilohertz, long after the, the sound has pretty much decayed there, things are still rattling around in this bottom you know, a couple of hundred hertz, and you can see these room resonances carrying on at that point. So what I've done here is I've moved the microphone back um, from the listening position. I've just edged it back towards the doors of your room, keeping it central to the listening position. And what we can see here is around 34, 35 hertz, which is the, the room mode the bottom of the room mode associated with the length dimension of your room. There are these fairly large variations immediately. Um, we're only moving the microphone a metre or two here. Um, but if we go up to 57 hertz, which is the room mode associated with the width of your room, nothing's really changing because we're still in the same place left to right. So if I were to show you another graph, I'm sure I can dig one, dig one out where we're moving the right microphone left to right, you'd see a big variation here and you'd see relative stasis at this point. So th th this really demonstrates the, the way that the, the modes are set up between parallel surfaces in the room. Very interesting. I remember actually when I first moved into this shed, and that's just literally what it is, it's a garden shed, um, uh, I remember clapping my hands and it having a longer decay than Air Lindhurst. <laughs> <laughs> but the worst decay I'd ever like... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. So, so I think the furniture does some, some kind of good. But um, so yeah, that there flutter echoes what you hear in there, which is when you've got parallel surfaces with nothing on, yeah. um, and they they do sound horrific. Um, so, <laughs> and you can fix them by just putting stuff there, which you've done a very good job at. <laughs> yeah, expensive job, called, <laughs> called 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 vintage sense. So you carried out the measurements. What was your di diagnosis before you started actually making stuff? We checked that you were concerned with how it sounded in the room rather than ins uh, insulation. So you weren't worried about uh, waking up neighbours or, or you know, uh, trains ruining your recordings. That's a, almost a completely separate area of acoustics. So you can do them at the same time, but it's very different and um very expensive right. so we, we'd agreed that you uh you wanted to to make the room sound better for mixing and recording so that's the first thing we kind of crossed a few things off the list there um then we're looking at uh in your room there was quite a lot of things to do with stereo imaging and early reflections so that that's when uh if the sound comes out of the speakers um some of it goes straight into your ears and that that's good um but it's also combined with sound that has come out of the speakers and bounced off something very close to you and arrived at your ears slightly later. Right. Uh, and then some together, and then all of a sudden your ear has some level of distortion, I guess. You know, it, it's, either, it's either interpreting it all as the same sound and, and thus it has a different frequency response to which your speaker intended, or it's perceived it as some kind of spatial thing and it's making you feel further to the left or further to the right which is where you end up with those kind of slightly fuzzy stereo images. There's quite a lot of that, that in your room because you've got lots of big furniture with lots of hard surfaces around you. Uh, and when I came to see you originally, there was also uh, quite a lot of hard surfaces, walls and ceiling-wise around you, you know, yeah. untreated ceiling above you, uh, some big patches uh, to your left and right around the speakers, which were also untreated. So we look at trying to get rid of those things early on in, in some acoustic treatment. It's quite relatively inexpensive to do in, in that um, uh, 
mineral fiber panels will do a good job there uh, absorbing early reflections um you, i think there's there's uh, in your room now there's a 50 millimeter panel above your head suspended above your head that's cutting out a you know huge early reflection your speakers weren't central about the middle of the room um which was making those early reflections not equal left to right so your ears again hearing those slightly distorted so moving your furniture around a bit, moving your speakers around a bit, so you're sitting in the middle of the room, uh, left to right, is quite important. Um, so that was an easy thing to, to get done uh, and to recommend early on. After that, um, we're looking at the overall response of the room and the dynamic response of the room. Uh, like I said, we were seeing that there was, there was quite a lot of low frequency resonance carrying on long after the sound had gone. That's because you had a, a small amount of acoustic treatment in the room, didn't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, most of that was made up of uh, relatively thin um, foam panels, so 50 mil or 70, I think there were some 75 mil panels in there stuck flush to the wall. Um, now, the, the issue with uh, porous absorption like that is, is that you can only really absorb high and mid-frequency sounds with thin treatment um that's to do with the whole relationship between wavelength and frequency we were discussing earlier so to you know to properly properly absorb very low frequency sound you need masses you know really massive treatment which of course at that point we're we're straying into this area where it's not realistic for you to for me to tell you that you know we're going to take away half a meter of your your walls on every side yeah so some compromise but certainly specifying uh, thicker treatment um, and in most cases in your room with a slight air gap behind uh, in that that brings it out from the wall which make, in many respects makes, makes it treat the sound as if it's a bit thicker uh, so you get a bit of low frequency extension to the absorption um, so that's aimed at evening up your room a bit as it decays so that the low frequencies don't rattle around for quite so long uh, the same goes for the ceiling. I mean, obviously, if I could put thicker panels on the ceiling, I would, but you wouldn't be able to walk through. So, again, putting a bit of a gap there on a, on a thinner panel is still um, bringing down the frequency of effectiveness there. They're um, a combination of um, mineral fibre absorbers, so effectively uh, rigidised mineral wool um, put in a frame and... and uh, so what what is what is that actual material mineral? Like uh, well, it's similar to rock wool. It's an it's an insulation material. One could make their own acoustic panels of that type with the right type of rock wool, very dense rock wool. And then a stretched fabric for stretched fabric over the top, which is acoustically transparent, so so the sound can get through and be treated, be absorbed by by that. Um, and then you've also got some panels in there which are called bad panels. Um, Binary amplitude diff sorbers. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, they have uh, they're a combination of of mineral fiber and uh, effectively um, a series of uh, of holes in some board, uh, which end up uh, with uh, low frequencies being absorbed and high frequencies being diffused. Um, that again was all part of the idea of trying to even up your frequency response as it decays a bit. So we're putting a tiny bit of energy back into the room at the high frequency end, um, so that you keep some life. Um, so you, you know, so you don't feel like you're you're working in an anechoic chamber all the time. Um, but so that some of those pesky, you know, low frequency resonances are tamed a little and shortened a little. So there's quite a lot of that in, in, in your room as well at certain positions. And there's also some Modex treatment in your room as well, which is a specialist low frequency absorption where uh, there is some of that mineral fiber in there, but there's also um, a plate, a big heavy metal plate that will sympathetically resonate with certain low frequencies and take the energy out of them uh, oh, wow. that position. It's interesting you mentioned the Anna Kirk thing because I remember in the late 80s and, and early 90s, when I first started going into recording studios, you had this sensation of your, it's almost like um, that sen sensation you get with noise cancelling headphones, of the air being sucked out of you as they close these massive doors. Was that a kind of fashion in the late twentieth century with acoustic design? Very much the the the, the dead room, um, 
and uh, that's fine. I get. I guess if that is that, if that's what you want, there are problems around people doing that badly. That's probably the most common problem I find with going into rooms that have already had a bit of treatment. Um, people, can, you can get the effect of that initially by sticking. 25 millimeter acoustic foam all around every root every wall and and i believe me i've seen it yeah um and you speak initially and you think oh yeah it sounds dead um particularly if you you haven't got a particularly low voice um but you start to realize that the the bottom of your voice is just going everywhere in there and it is very very weird and disconcerting at that point uh, and that's quite common. I think lots of people kind of took that dead room idea and then did it badly, uh, and you've ended up with all these, all these rooms with with just you know low frequency resonance everywhere, but you know not a not a tiny bit of life at the top end. It's not a complete no no, but it does seem to have have moved on to a space that has slightly more uh, relationship to real life. A few years back, I was sampling a tuba in Air Lindhurst Hall, which is an enormous room in North London. Now, traditionally, the tuba sits to the right of the conductor, or as us show business types would say, stage left. So above the conductor, you've got a tree mic, a decker tree, which has got your right, your left, and your center microphone. And we were very surprised to see that at a certain pitch, the left microphone peaked and distorted. How can that be so when he's sitting all the way over there? Well, I was told it was likely that the pitch was low enough to have created a standing wave, otherwise known as a mode. Let me talk to you about modes. We're gonna need um, a tape measure to demonstrate. That's an F. How do I know it? Well, it's creating a standing wave, a vibration, a resonance between these two surfaces in this small room. And if you measure the distance between them, 38 inches, and look on the internet, you'll see that that is exactly the width of the waveform of F3. A standing wave is a creation of a mode between these two surfaces, and you have nodes and antinodes in between. Standing wave. No standing wave. Right, I'm definitely going to get this wrong because it's not my area of expertise, but correct me in the comments down below and any brilliant corrections will be pinned. So do check out the comments. Right, plus, minus, neutral, an axis, and this is a waveform, a single oscillation, or as I understand it, this distance here is the mode. Now I've looked online and it's argued that maybe the fundamental is created between here and here, but as I understand it, it's from here to here. This peak here and this trough here, this is the node, this is the anti-node, and this is the mode. Now the number of oscillations we get per second is the frequency measured in hurts. I think it's nuts to think that the smallest waveform a human ear can hear is actually about a centimetre long, half an inch. It's just a bit longer than a centimetre, depending on usually your age. I can hear up to 12k. So we fixed the acoustic sound as much as we can in the shed, but my situation, slightly off centre, a big whopping great screen, metal shelves, vintage synths, lots of metal, is far from perfect. Can we get it to a more perfect stage so that I can create masters in my garden shed? How are we doing, gents? Good, oh, thanks. Man, yeah. Great, amazing job, and it's all back together again, all what working. Do do? What's the, the last bit of the kind of jigsaw puzzle? I see there's this very mysterious thing here. We've got basically two two more things to do. We're just getting the positioning of the speakers exactly right. Right. So we want an equilateral triangle between you, left speaker, and right speaker. Okay. We want them the same distance from the walls. Yeah. And then we need to set up the trend off properly for you, uh, for your listening position, uh, which is what the uh, fancy mic's for. Okay. Um, and where is the trim off? Uh, it's under <clears> your desk at the moment. Where, if you, we are planning to rack it up at our next uh, visit, if you decide to keep it, so we can make some custom cables for it. Now, I was a real skeptic where this was concerned. You also recommended a box called a Trinov, which is a kind of electric acoustic corrector. 
unit. You'll probably have to explain it to me in a more elegant manner, eloquent manner rather. Nothing can take away reverb very well. Um, uh, Isotope would uh, disagree with me, I'm sure, but um, really, you can't really take away reverb uh, real time. Um, and so there's no point in buying a plug-in plug or a Trinov um, to correct a room instead of acoustic treatment. But um, when you have treated a room, there are things that really are uh, are odds with your workflow. Like I said, I, I couldn't have advised you to have you know lost uh, half a meter off every wall in your room. So there's there's things about the low frequency of your room which physical acoustic treatment just isn't realistic to completely change. There are also situations where the the, the room can't that for whatever reason the person can't sit in the middle of the room. Um, uh, another film composer who you know know well um, has to sit off center, and and that you know we've done acoustic treatment there. But regardless of how you do it, there's still going to be some sounds that are arriving at the wrong time at their ears. Um, and at that point, you can start to look at maybe doing something to the sound before it comes out of the speakers to to, to correct things. Um, now historically. Um, People maybe put a graphic EQ in and, and fiddled with it. Um, and then more recently, there's been quite a lot of plugins that um, do that kind of thing. And some speakers now does it, do it, don't they? I indeed, know Dynaudio indeed. Has some, yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's some worth in them sometimes. Um, they're doing a sim. Off the, the better ones of those plugins and speakers come with a microphone, a bit like the measurement microphone I brought round to you ori originally. And they'll look at the frequency response there and they'll try and correct it. The problem you often end up with with systems like that is, is the relationship between phase, i.e. the time that sound arrives, and amplitude, i.e. how loud it is at different frequencies. And historically, you know, that the same principle as, you know, if you tweak a, a graphic EQ until it's perfectly flat at your listening position, the, the phase of what you're listening to is all over the place and, and you get that really kind of feeling a bit queasy feeling at, at the listening position. And the, the, the relationship is really, really intrinsically linked and, and makes it very hard to do that kind of thing. So historically, uh, acousticians are careful around that kind of area um, rather than physical treatment. Uh, the Trinov uh, is a, a real step forward there. Um, it... it it recommends what you should be, what it what it would like to do with your sound, uh, based on measurements taken from a 3D microphone. So, so that's our first position. Then we'll do one a little further back, and then we'll do a left one. Right. That's effectively three omnis in one, um, hearing the sound from all directions and doing that test again. Uh, and that's allowing that microphone, or, or at least it's allowing the Trinov to interpret the, the output of that microphone to know a little bit more about where the speakers are, um, where the reflections are coming from, and the responses in those directions. Um, so it's not your ears still, um, but it's getting a lot closer to the human human ear. Um, and thus it's managing to treat those issues a, a lot more accurately now. And the Trinov does manage to uh, correct certain frequency uh, amplitude irregularities without wrecking the phase of the speakers and, and the phase of your listening position. Um, so yeah, it's very powerful. It is a it's a hardware unit. Um, so it's, it's effectively a computer that's running all the time, processing what comes out of your door um, before your speakers, um, and and correcting it that way. Um, I would caveat what I've just said is that it, it there are things you've got to remember with all these things that they are they aren't people. They're just microphones and computers. Um, so it doesn't know what speakers you've got. Um, it, it will try and correct things that you don't want correcting. It doesn't know, know where your room is. It doesn't know where you sit. It, it, and it doesn't know what you, your Dyn Audios sound like. So there are things that we then do to configure it to, 
you, you'll start to see as, as you see it start to do its work you think oh no it's, it's it's compensating for a characteristic of that monitor now and so you can then close that down and stop it doing that and uh, you know it ne needs to be used in some moderation and with some level of professional taming i think i thought that i had uh, not particularly good good hearing i've always presumed just because of the amount that i the, the levels that i monitor at that um uh, 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 I've, I've probably got crap ears and i've always said i don't have hi-fi hearing i did a, uh, um, uh, an audiology test the other day and um they reported that i have the hearing of an 18 year old hey <laughs> which is still great on the top i guess it's 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 the ability to describe sound is is quite difficult and all i would say is um the minute i came into the room i was just happier i think that so often we try and describe sounds and try and hear differences instead of just going, how, how do you feel in this space? Mm. space. Now, yeah. I really enjoy speaking in this space when there are horrible kind of corners where you get these kind of almost like wolf tones. Um, yeah. Um, so that, that was immediately as I, as I came in had, uh, after the treatment had been fitted. Now, I was hyper cynical about the Trinov, but the minute it was switched on, it was it was like someone had taken two socks out of my ears. Mm. Um, you could just suddenly hear everything. I think so often we kind of get off on the bottom end and how bassy our speakers sound. It wasn't as if that disappeared. It was just I could hear everything else suddenly. Mm. And um, and at that point, it was like because you were lending it to me, it was like you you would have had to have shot me in the face to have taken it away from me. The next project for this studio here is. Um, I'm starting to do more work as a composer and I've got uh, films coming up and we went down from 5.1 to stereo a few years ago and we're going to have to go back up again and that will mean that we'll need to upgrade the Trinov, I believe. Yes, that's right. You've got a stereo unit there. Um, 5.1 uh, units are available. Um, they also, such yeah, the nature of 5.1 is is the... The surrounds are very rarely in the right place unless you've built the room for it. Um, and so it's quite good at dealing with that kind of thing as well, uh, at inserting the correct delay for, for that kind of thing and making them feel like they're in the right place. So so that that will probably be a, a good thing to, to do when when you move there. I've loved working in the shed. It's my the perfect mixture of both worlds. Um, but I was always aware that the, the, the sound, the acoustic, was a massive compromise. And so to actually, it's like a dream come true. Um, but, but the other thing that I've also noticed, which is, wasn't something we really mentioned, is, is my wife is recording an album at the moment. And she's been, she did some recordings before you did the acoustic treatment. And I would say they weren't usable. And since you put the acoustic treatment in, they're absolutely beautiful. And I've got some nice microphones and stuff. Um, so that's a kind of an unexpected byproduct of, of the that's treatment that you've done. So, so thank you so much. But oh, for, pleasure. So for people who are wanting to do them, this themselves, uh, for whatever reason, maybe economic, are there some basic kind of principles or common mistakes that people make, things to look out for? Definitely don't coat all the walls with, with 50 mil foam. <laughs> You can do very simple things initially about thinking about whether your speakers are central to the acoustic centre of the room, left to right, um, yeah. and whether you're sitting between them and whether there's loosely um, the same distance from you to the speakers as the speaker to the speaker. So it's so an equilateral equal triangle. Gotcha. Anything like a desktop where the speaker's going to make it resonate or worse, rattle against it. Um, all of those things are complete you know, inefficient um, for, for the speaker's performance. So at that point, there's no point in spending loads of money on the room. Get the speakers on the stand so, so that they're, they're well supported and they can do their best work. If you already own them, that makes total sense to me. Often in a small room, um, that one ceiling panel above your head makes a huge difference to tightening the, the image a little. If you can, if you've got enough room, suspend it rather than put it flush. And then it can still be a kind of 50 millimeter panel, um, which, which isn't a, a great, you know, great expense really. Um, and and that, that air gap there will help it a little. And you can, if you've got enough room, angle it slightly down towards the speakers can, can, can help a little there. I, it, not always, but it's a good general rule of thumb. And then starting around the speakers to just get some absorption there. And I say try and start nearly always with wall acoustic panel based treatment 
really you're nearly always looking at 100 millimeters minimum rather than the cheaper thinner stuff and it's worth waiting to to get that so that you don't end up with these kind of lopsided rooms i think that one of the the problems um and i think it took some time for me to overcome it really is that there's a natural uh desire to shove your desk right up against the wall mm -hmm. in rooms mm -hmm. and in for fact, space yeah for space but also just there's something a bit weird about having a desk that's away from the wall but it, uh, you, you do get used to it from an aesthetic point of view. And it's not like you have to come miles into the, 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 the middle of the room. Um, it is just about forming that equilateral triangle, uh, as, you, as you said. If you're going to do, do that or you, you've moved yourself back, but your speakers still have to be slammed up against the front, getting something reasonably thick behind the speakers that's absorbent is quite important. Um, at that point because you end up with uh, something they call um, speaker boundary interference response where the sound can bounce off a nearby surface from the speaker and then combine with the stuff that's coming straight from the speaker to your ear. If you've got the speaker kind of right up against the wall but close to it, that can be quite destructive, that, that combination of things. So having something behind the speaker at that point, which I think we've done in your room, mm -hmm. it's quite important for that if you're gonna if you must go right up there again against the wall like that. Now if someone's walking into, I don't know, they've maybe just rented a new property or they bought a property or they they've they've got a shed at the end of their garden. If they're walking into a room for the first time and they're planning their space, where do you recommend lengthwise or widthwise? And, and where, again, if someone's going, okay, blank canvas, I want to make the, the best of this room, how would you recommend the positioning? Finding a place where you can have some symmetry left to right is quite important. And that nearly always cuts out one or two places um, because of doors and, and windows and the like. Um, as a general rule of thumb, it can be easier to, to deal with acoustics in, in domestic rooms if you're working long ways, so you, you have a long room rather than a wide room. It doesn't always follow, uh, but there, there are some advantages to, to, to treating, particularly with regard to the stereo image, of a, of a slightly longer room rather than a wide one in a domestic space like that. Something that I've been saying to a lot of people who are getting into this game, particularly with media composition, is that I think that this is potentially a golden era. I mean, th there are always people going, well, how are we going to earn money about it? And there are conundrums with this ever-changing world. But I think it is, is, it is likely that because of the number of points of sale for music, that there's going to be work out there. But I think it is highly likely that people, by and large, will be mixing from home or from their own facilities. And do you feel, particularly on the multitude of different environments in how people consume so-called content, whether it be home cinema systems, in a cinema, or indeed on a phone, do you think that, that having a consideration for your acoustic environment is important so that you can best represent your music on this multitude of devices? As music professionals, I think we... we owe it to everyone else to try and hold the line here a bit at the moment and um you know lots of the democratization of of music creation is brilliant it does mean that there are few gate, gate fewer gatekeepers on the quality of things so I, I really think that's important yeah absolutely and even like you you said when you came into your room originally and you clapped and you had flutter echoes everywhere simply putting those shelves up to, to provide that diffusion on, on your left and right in the middle of the room there makes a huge difference um you already owned those shelves most people own shelves put them there um you know putting a putting a sofa in at the back you no know, big piece of thick absorption there to kind of tame the bottom end a bit again doesn't cost anything if you own the sofa so there are simple things to do which just require some thought Brilliant stuff, Ben. Well, listen, thanks again. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you later in the year when we'll have our next phase with the shed. I think that what I find really interesting about studios is I always want them to be kind of like fixed and finished, but they never are, are they? <laughs> Life's work, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> thanks so much, mate. No worries. No worries. Cheers, Christian. I thank Ben so much for some of that real gold dust of advice and hope you can find your equilateral triangle. Thanks so much for watching till the end and I'd be really fascinated to hear about solutions that you've found in your shed 
bedroom or your office space, if you will. Do one of those for Ben would be great. And subscribe if you haven't done already. Plenty of exciting stuff coming up. And ding that bell to be notified the next time I put up a film. See you next time.